poverty. The second thing we need to do is cut the bills. Now, people in Britain are paying some of the highest energy bills in Europe. And our businesses are also paying high energy bills. And what does that mean? Well, it means that we end up exporting jobs overseas. We end up producing them in Britain. And what we need to do is we need to cut those bills. And it's possible. It's possible to do that. Because we can see what's happened in the United States when they started using shale gas. We can see what's happened in other countries when they've seen a greater production of energy. And we can learn those lessons here in the United Kingdom. Now, some environmentalists will say using our own gas is not environmentally friendly. But how environmentally friendly is it to rely on regimes abroad, often whom have very poor records for our gas, to ship that gas into the United Kingdom, often at both environmental cost and financial cost, how environmentally friendly is that? And currently, we are projected to be importing two gas within 10 years. Now, we are sitting on 50 years' worth of sustainable gas. Can you imagine, if we unleash that, what that would mean for households, what that would mean for businesses? Well, we can see from the United States that their energy bills are half what our energy bills are here. Can you imagine the impact it would have on the British economy if we did that? If we unleash that gas that we are sitting on at the moment into our economy. And the fact is that we have already made progress. We're now licensing new fields in the North Sea. But we need to make more progress. We need to unlock our potential, develop our economic security, deliver cheap bills for people across the country, which they're desperately in need of with the difficulties we have with cost of living, at the same time as making our industries efficient, effective, and competitive. And the third thing we need to do is we need to build more homes. The fact is we haven't built enough homes. And it's incredibly difficult if you're a young person to get on the property ladder. It's incredibly difficult to even rent a property in big cities like Manchester and London. It's just far too expensive. And whilst lots of members of parliament talk about building more homes, it's very difficult to actually get them to vote for reducing the regulation that's stopping the homes being built. It's all about protecting newts or installing a bat bridge. That appears to be the priority rather than building homes. So I think we need to turbocharge the incentives. We need to incentivize local areas to build more homes through giving them tax breaks if they're prepared to get rid of that red tape. And I think we need to do it at a level so we are building 500,000 new homes every year. I think that is the state we are now in. The prices are so high, the cost of living is so difficult for families that we need to build 500,000 homes every year. And that won't just mean people will find it easier to get into a home. People will find it easier to start a family because there will be more affordable housing. Employers will find it easier to employ people somewhere because their workers can afford homes. It will also save the government money. It will save the government money because we will cut our housing benefit bill. We won't need to intervene so much in the housing market because we are making the prices cheaper. And that is fundamental to what these reforms should be about. So there are three things we can do. We can axe the tax, we can cut the bills, and we can build the homes. But I'm in no, under no illusion. I don't think this is necessarily easy for us to do. It's difficult. But we need to be prepared to do the difficult things because that is what will make Britain grow again. And all of the people in this room, mainly mine as some of the members of the media, all of the people in this room need to be out there making those arguments because people need to hear those conservative arguments again. The way we're going to bring the price of housing down 
or the price of energy down is not through a rent cap or price controls. It's through more supply. It's simply by having more of it. That's what will bring prices down. That is a free market conservative argument. The second thing... And people need to hear these arguments again. The second thing we need to do is acknowledge where we are now. Now, some people have been claiming that we live in some kind of free market paradise in Britain, that somehow the problems we have as a, are as a result of too much neoliberalism. Look at the facts. Government spending as a proportion of GDP is now 46%. It has not been higher since the 1970s, and in fact, it was lower for most of the 1970s, apart from 1975. That is the only year where government spending as a proportion of GDP has been higher. So we need to acknowledge that government is too big, that taxes are too high, and that we are spending too much. That's very important. And the final thing we need to do is actually bring these arguments home to people. So what does it actually mean for people across the United Kingdom that we haven't grown as much as we could have? Well, if we'd grown as much as America, if we had the same GDP per capita as America, the average Brit would be £9,000 better off. Now think what that means. Think what that means for the ability to buy a new car, the ability to go on holiday, the, the ability to buy something for your children. That makes a huge difference to the average person in Britain. And that is what we have to talk about. We have to talk about the results of this policy. So let's stop taxing and banning things. Let's instead build things and make things. Let's be prepared to make conservative arguments again, even if it's unpopular, even if it's difficult. I want everybody in this room to unleash their inner conservative. And finally, my friends, let's make Britain grow again. Thank you. Thank you, Liz Truss. Well, I must say my job here is to chair and compare, as it were, but I do have to say I, I agree with uh, building more homes. And my latest book, Home Truths, The UK's Chronic Housing Shortage, is available in the conference bookshop and I'll be signing copies at 4pm on Tuesday, right after somebody called Theresa May. Anyway. Ranald Jar Wardner was Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs and previously he was the Minister for International Trade. He was elected as the Tory MP for North East Hampshire in 2015, coming from a background in banking and commerce. Ladies and gentlemen, Ranul Jarwardner. Well, thank you very much, Liam, and thank you everyone for being here. The danger, as those of you who have been to conference before with a session like this, is we all repeat ourselves. So let me try uh, to make a few new, new points while I'm here. Um, the way I see it, friends, is that economic growth isn't simply a statistic or a fleeting trend. It's the heartbeat of our nation. It's the pulse of our progress. And it is so important to remember that it isn't just about money. It's about people. We, the Conservative Party, must always strive to get things done as the people's government. And the true beneficiaries of economic growth are our citizens. They enjoy better jobs, higher wages, and improved living standards. Take the United States, as Liz has just said. Higher incomes and a better quality of life have become synonymous with their growth story. We, too, can aspire for such prosperity. Indeed, we must ensuring that every individual in every corner of our country feels the tangible benefits of a thriving economy. Together, as the Conservative Party, we can build that brighter future. And to truly thrive, we must drive forward our party, our government, and our country with purpose. Infrastructure. 
is not just concrete and steel, it's the backbone of our dreams, the framework of this country's future. Studies have shown that for every pound invested in infrastructure, economies can expect a return of two or three times the initial investment. And the proof is seen around the world. From France to the United States, economies have seen significant economic boosts from infrastructure. Put simply, investment today means prosperity tomorrow. But let's take a closer look at home. You might have heard that the government wanted to build some homes in our cities. But when proposing a new quarter to Cambridge, it was suggested this couldn't possibly happen because we've known that there's not enough water there for years. The problem, my friends, isn't that there's not enough water, it's that we've known about it for years and not done anything about it. The much-needed Cambridgeshire Reservoir serves as a stark example of the planning system's inefficiencies. This vital system has been mired in bureaucratic delays. Construction, can you believe it, won't begin until 2029 at the earliest, and the reservoir might only open 10 years later. Why? Consultations are endless. Planning permission and construction dates are pushed further into the future. The reservoir once on stream would be a massive boon for the local area, but why must we wait for so long for such essential projects? We need to get things done. Our communities deserve better, and they do deserve it right now. And at the same time, cities like London, Birmingham, Manchester, and Leeds, alongside Oxford and Cambridge, pulse with potential for the future, but they just don't have enough homes. Every year, countless young people eager to kick-start their careers, flock to these city centres, drawn by the allure of opportunity, the promise of growth. But the high cost of housing in our cities is not just a barrier for them. It has huge ripple effects for everyone. As professionals are priced out of our cities, they seek homes in surrounding areas, inadvertently driving up the cost of property there. And that makes it so difficult for people across our country without high London salaries to secure homes, creating a divide that's impossible to bridge. Within our existing city limits, there is ample opportunity to address our housing challenge by utilizing brownfield sites, exploiting air rights over railways, and regenerating old council estates. We can use the available space in our cities without even having to consider expansion into greenfield sites. And the numbers speak for themselves. In London, with this vast expanse and numerous brownfield sites, there's the potential to build a million new homes. Birmingham, Manchester and Leeds could see another 500,000 too. To realise that potential, to get this done, we must streamline our planning processes and ensure that projects aren't held up by this bureaucratic red tape. It's time to build homes in our cities, to build up our cities, to build for future generations. And future generations are the key. The strength of a nation lies not in its treasury, but in its families. As chairman of the Conservative Growth Group, which, Liam, I'm delighted to say, is now over 60 MPs. We're growing, we're growing. Um, I'm delighted to be working with a number of great think tanks to take our party's policy forward, including the Centre for Policy Studies. And our recent joint report was crystal clear in calling out our tax system. In its current form, the British tax system is skewed against Britain's families. Instead of looking at our household circumstances as a whole, our one-size-fits-all system treats spouses as strangers and taxes them regardless. This means that two families with the same incomes end up paying vastly different, different levels of tax just because one person might be at home to look after their children or their elderly relatives. That's just not fair. And as good Europeans, all of us, uh, this disparity becomes even starker when we look beyond our shores to near neighbours in France and Germany. In Germany, the concept of income splitting for married couples allows for a more equitable distribution of tax burdens. It recognises the shared financial burdens within a family, making tax rates fairer. France, on the other hand, has adopted the family quotient system, a system that takes into account the number of family members, adjusting the tax rate accordingly. 
larger families find themselves with a reduced tax rate in a nod to not only the additional expenses they incur, but also the need for a growing population. Such policies don't just recognize, but rightly reward the contributions of families to society. And these are the sorts of targeted tax measures that are most affordable to help those who are both doing the right thing and need our help the most. This is how we can get behind the squeezed middle, the backbone of our nation, our teachers, our nurses, our policemen, those who are hit hardest today. Our families deserve this fairness. And why stop there? Everyone should have the freedom to live their life as they wish and spend their hard-earned money as they want. But doesn't it just feel like the tax man is breathing down your neck from cradle to grave? It's time for tax reform at every stage in people's lives, from first-time buyers to homeowners, from couples to families, from entrepreneurs to those who have worked their whole lives and want to hand something down to their loved ones. Tax cuts done right can ignite the engines of innovation and growth. By refining our approach, we can create the landscape where businesses bloom, entrepreneurship is encouraged, and hard-working families reap the rewards. Scrapping an inheritance tax, the death tax, not only means families can pass on their hard-earned savings to the next generation, but alongside scrapping stamp duty on principal homes can get the next generation onto the property ladder, yeah. making the dream of home ownership real again. Reforming IR35 will lead to a more flexible labour market, allowing for greater adaptability in rapidly changing economic landscapes and can help pave the way for families to not just meet their basic needs, but aspire for more again. And raising the VAT registration threshold for businesses will stimulate investment, encourage businesses to grow, and reduce the amount of work done in the black market, which surely HMRC can get behind. And it will mean that both established businesses and startups can thrive again. And these are the sorts of targeted measures that are fa fair for families good for small businesses, and it's how we make Britain grow again. So in the tapestry of our nation's narrative, every thread counts. Infrastructure, housing, families, fair taxation. These are the pillars upon which our society is based, and indeed we, the Conservative Party, build our shared destiny. Growth isn't just an economic imperative. It's our moral and political duty. It's up to us, as Conservatives, to chart this path forward towards a brighter, more prosperous future for Britain where everyone can thrive. And that is how, my friends, we move forward, not just as families and individuals, but as a truly united kingdom. Thank you very much. Interesting stuff. So there are now 60 MPs in the Conservative Growth Group. Isn't that about the size of the government's working majority? Yeah. This debate on tax is going to get very, very interesting. And I think around 30 Tory MPs, including our speakers, have made clear they won't vote for any fiscal measures that include higher taxation. Yeah. Again, interesting, as the government tries to get its budget through the House of Commons. Just saying. Jacob Rees-Mogg has been MP for North East Somerset since 2010, a former leader of the House, a former business secretary. He also previously chaired the ERG. Sometimes somewhat unkindly called, if I may, the member, the right honourable member for the early 18th century, Jacob's actually widely respected across the House for his mastery of policy detail and particularly the procedures of the House of Commons. And having set up his own asset management company, he knows his way around the world of finance and the city as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg. Um, Liam forgot to say, I'm also a GB News presenter. So, um, <laughs> I, 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 for those of you who watch, I am still Jacob Rees-Mogg. Um, and we've got a whole bevy of GB News presenters here this afternoon. Thank you all for coming. We're obviously all pro-growth, but let me do a survey of opinion. Who here thinks the state is too big, spends too much money? Hands up. 
Yep, pretty. One or two don't. Not, perhaps they've come to the wrong conference. They should be somewhere next week. <laughs> and that is the size of our challenge. As Liz said, it's 46% of the nation's wealth every year is being spent by the government. And what do we know as one of the fundamental principles of conservatism? What do we exude from every pore as conservatives as a thought, if thoughts can be exuded from every pore? We think that we spend our money better than the government can. And that is a fundamental point because every penny spent by the government is a penny not spent by us or by our children. Because money borrowed is taxation delayed. It isn't free money, it isn't funny money, it isn't the magic money tree. It is taxation postponed. And we know that we spend it better. So that must be our starting point when we talk about tax, that the state should do less and do what it does better. And then we need to look at the whole gamut of taxation, the whole range of taxes and the reform that you need. Because, yes, there are important bits to, de to do, and I entirely agree with Ranel at IR35, should be scrapped, and that death duties, that pernicious tax, you know the undertaker comes with the tax man following behind, pulling a long face as he takes the money out of the coffin before it's even buried. I mean, the horror <laughs> of death duties is one that we should never forget. But it's worse than that. It's not just mean, it's a bad tax. Why are death duties a bad tax? Because they lead to misallocation of capital. Why does that matter? It matters because our economy will only grow, make Britain grow again, if capital is allocated well. Whereas all sorts of people allocate their capital to avoid inheritance tax. And that means they hold into investments too long, they don't put it in uh, to equities except on the AIM market, they put it endlessly into farmland. Asset misallocation is a great holder back of growth. So yes, it's an important tax to deal with, but actually we need to look at our whole structure. Because what are you aiming to do with taxation? You are aiming to raise the money you need with the least economic distortion. And what we currently do is have endless distortion because politicians want you to do certain things. They think some things are good for you, and some things are bad for you. And therefore, the tax system should be giving incent incentives one way and another. As Ranel says, tax man doesn't much like the family, so you lose out if you're in a family. It thinks that capital investment by firms is automatically good and therefore has a high rate of corporation tax with lots of offsets. This is precisely the wrong way around. You want to have low rates of tax with very few offsets. That's what Ronald Reagan did so successfully. And what happens? You grow the tax base because you grow the economy. And if you grow the tax base, you can spend money, the government can spend taxpayers' money, and afford to do things that people want. That doesn't make the expenditure necessarily efficient, but at least it makes it affordable. So we should be really ambitious in the details of tax reform, in going through it to simplify to work out what each tax does and whether it is justifiable. Now, unfortunately, and I have to tell you things that you won't necessarily like to hear as well as all the jolly ones, income tax is a very efficient tax, as is a sales tax of some kind. You might argue about reforming VAT as it currently works, and I've certainly increased the threshold, but they're both good taxes because they fall on things that you have to do. You have to be paid. When well, tax gets to 100%, you might decide to be a volunteer. But by and large, you have to be paid, and you have to buy things. So those taxes have a cash flow attached to them that is essential. So they're an efficient way of taxing without economic distortion. Capital taxation, whether it's capital gains tax, death duties, or stamp duties, are oddly voluntary taxes. Now, I'm not saying you should go off and be cryogenically frozen to keep yourself in some sense alive to avoid death duties, but it is nonetheless a voluntary tax. You can arrange your affairs not to pay it. Capital gains tax, you decide to pay it when you sell an asset, and stamp duty, you decide not to buy a house because stamp duty is too high. Voluntary taxes are bad and inefficient and economically distorting taxes. So that's where we need tax reform, and we need ideally simplicity. Now, this will shock you all. I'm glad most of you are sitting down. The ones of you standing at the back have the smelling salts ready because 
I had a plan last year that was too radical even for Liz Truss, if you could imagine <laughs> such a shocking thing. I mean, how could I? How could I let the side down in such a way? Um, I thought we should have a flat tax. And I actually think it's affordable. If, there is a big if on this, it's if the Treasury's um, statistics are right. Now, normally they're not. So <laughs> it may be that it doesn't quite work. But you could get rid of all the allowances and get to a flat tax of 20%. And I think that would give us a real opportunity for growth because look what's happened uh, to Estonia. The extraordinary growth it's achieved with a flat tax. So we want to look at the details and simplify. But there are two sides to growth. It's not just tax. Tax, of course, is a disincentive to growth. But there's regulation as well, that great burden of regulation. Now, in this room of young conservative activists, none of you other than me will remember the 1979 Conservative Party political broadcast when we had a runner, three runners, I think, come out, and one of them had a union jack on. And the one with the union jack was winning the race. How politically incorrect is that nowadays to say that the United Kingdom might be winning a global competitive race. Nonetheless, we were, until some bureaucrat came on and put a weight round the runner, and then another weight round the runner, and then another one, and the poor old runner was struggling, rather like I do when running races with my children. I always lose, and I effectively, metaphorically, have these weights round me. And that's what we've done to the economy with regulation, and we should change it. I was very pleased that the Prime Minister has rode back on some green regulations, they are bonkers, and they are ruining our industry. In my seven weeks as Energy Secretary, I discovered that British Steel was being expected to produce steel on which it would have a cash loss to maintain its ETSs, its Emission Trading Scheme credits, because otherwise it would lose them and it would be priced out of producing when the market recovered. This is mad. What do we do instead? We import the steel from China and we say they're Chinese emissions rather than British emissions. We are strangling British industry with lunatic energy regulations that make our electricity, I think, the third highest in the world after those bastions of free trade, um, Denmark and Germany. The US has about half the cost of energy that we do. So that's one of the things we must do. We must look at these green regulations and say, look, let's be frank about it. We don't make a blind bit of difference. We could close down, we could turn all the lights out. We could switch off the television cameras here, which would be a sadness for us all. And still, in about two minutes, China would have made up all the emissions that were coming from the lights we are burning and the cameras that are whirring. We don't make any difference. We are just making people's lives harder, and we ought to stop doing that. We also need to look at the effects of regulation. And I hope you've all read Rory Sutherland's spectator piece on the ridiculousness of 20 mile an hour speed limits and the incredible effect they have on deliveries because they make things so much less efficient. Speed and efficiency relate. So we need to look at the whole gamut of regulations. We need to challenge vested interests. Ladies and gentlemen, what is the point of politicians? Now that may be a metaphysical question for you to answer when you go home this evening or to think about in Mail Mog when you're watching TV News between 8 and 9 o'clock this evening, having watched Nigel between 7 and 8. <laughs> but surely our point is to help you make your lives better and to assume you have the same ambitions as we do. And what ambitions do we all have? That our children and potentially grandchildren should have a better standard of living than we do. Shouldn't that be driving us every day? And shouldn't that mean we therefore want greater prosperity and efficiency within our economy? And that we're on the side of the individual, the consumer, against the protectionist corporation? Now take the REACH regulations. You, you all know about the REACH regulations, I expect. They're the chemical regulations that the chemical industry hated, campaigned, paid wealthy lobbyists to oppose until they came in, at which point they paid the same wealthy lobbyists to campaign to keep them. Because they said, well, we paid for them, and therefore let's keep the high prices. We should be on the side of the consumer and low prices and challenge vested interests. Take the city, something I know a little bit about, and MIFID II. Well, MIFID II was hated when it came in, but once people had implemented it, of course it's a barrier to entry. It's a closed shop. Didn't Margaret Thatcher get rid of the closed shop for trade unions? Well, I want to get rid of the closed shop for businesses. 
We're on the side of competition. We're not on the side of corporate self-interest. Business, not self-interest. And therefore, we should get rid of MIFID II. Um, and uh, we should be open to the world, because I worry that we're going in the opposite direction. Now, who here thinks, I'm going to do another poll, who here thinks just in principle that French food is dangerous? Just <laughs> automatically dangerous. That one wise gentleman there. Now, look, I don't like their stinky cheese very much. I'm afraid I think a gentleman only eats cheddar and stilton. But having said that, I think it should be free to import it without having a vet inspect it before it comes over. Now, it may be that the French want a vet to inspect our cheddar cheese, but that's their fault and a damage to their consumer. We should not damage our consumer retaliatorily just because others are doing it. We have to have an open, free market. We should get rid of all the remaining tariffs. Now, we may have to scale them back to protect the farmers over 10 years, but they must go. Who here wants more expensive food? No, one person wants more expensive food. You're a hero, sir. Brave man, I want cheaper food. I want hormone-injected beef from New Zealand, well, not New Zealand, from Australia. I've eaten beef in Australia. It was absolutely delicious. There's nothing wrong with it. And they should be allowed to export it here because we want lower costs. So, what should we do? To make Britain grow again, we should be on the side of the consumer. What should we do about taxation? Reform it so it actually works, so that we have a sensible system. And what should we do with regulation? We should go through it with a fine-tooth comb. We should get rid of little regulations and big regulations, fat ones, thin ones, tall ones, long ones, and reduce them in size to make Britain grow again. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. I, I first met Priti Patel quite a few years ago, 1997. She was the, uh, the press secretary for somebody called Jimmy Goldsmith in the referendum party, and I was the intrepid young political correspondent for the Financial Times. It's been interesting watching her career since then. She has, of course, been Home Secretary, Secretary of State for International Development, having become Member of Parliament for Whitham in Essex in 2010. Born in London to a proud Ugandan Indian family, she's proudly pro-business and is well known for her close links to the Tory grassroots. And last night I saw Priti Patel in her pink dress, I think the same one that you went to Buckingham Palace in, I wasn't going to mention it, making the case to the Conservative Democratic Organisation for, in quotes, full-blooded conservatism. Ladies and gentlemen, Dame Priti Patel. Well, Liam, thank you for ageing me so well, basically. And look, my friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's an absolute pleasure not just to be here today, but actually to see so many of our grassroots activists in the room at our party conference, because at the end of the day, as Liam has just disclosed, I'm so ancient, I remember the days when party conference was not full of journalists, no disrespect to our friends, but actually it was for our members, led by our members, and also our policies were driven by our members as well. So I'm delighted to be here today because, you know, this is exactly what we stand for as Conservatives. We want our country to be successful. We want our country to be thriving and growing, a beacon of light in the world. World. And let's be quite clear, you know, we've heard a bit from the doomsters and the gloomsters in recent years, some may be in this room, some may be, you know, have been referenced in the past, our institutions, a few economists, perhaps some in the media as well. But look, we as Conservatives believe in enterprise, we believe in growth, and quite frankly, we believe in the success of our country. We believe in Britain, and that is absolutely crucial, it really is. And we've already heard from my colleagues and friends. You know, we've seen over recent years, Liz has touched on this, Jacob and Ranel as well. There's a major theme here. Yes, we want growth. Yes, we need the reforms that have been touched on already. But actually, our country has suffered from low growth, and poor productivity for too long, for many of the reasons, actually, that have been said already. And, of course, everyone wants to comment on that. Um, but at the end of the day, we've also been subject 
Actually, when we think about the political climate, and Liam has touched on this too, you know, we have people denounce Brexit, oppose free markets, despite saying that they are pro-free markets, growing the size of the state. And of course, where has that got that? That's got us into the state that we're in right now. High taxes, low growth, poor productivity. But the sad thing is, of course, my friends, this has all happened, both under Labour governments and Conservative governments. And I'm a great believer, one of the greatest things that gives us that distance, that strategic distance in the minds of the great British public is, of course, we in our great party, the Conservative Party, we've always been the advocates for growth. We've always been the advocates for giving people the freedom to succeed, the chance to better themselves, entrepreneurs standing up for businesses. But when we have seen in this century alone annual growth past just 3% in just four years and two of those were the economy when the economy bounced back from the pandemic lockdown, when you compare that, and Jacob has touched on this already, to the halcyon days almost, to the growth that we experienced in the 1980s, and just think about this, that was an era when there was high inflation, high unemployment, Amazing reforms that took place actually by a great conservative leader, a radical reforming prime minister, unleashed growth in the city. You know, during that time, back then, just in one decade, we had four years of economic growth above 3%. A decade where billions more was added to our economy, where new jobs, businesses were created and established, and more people benefited from, yes, the wealth that was created, the fact that families could choose, as Liz has said, the chance to spend more of their hard press money on the things that they chose to do, and not always the state. It's worth reminding ourselves, of course, that was a period when we just, um, defeated socialism and did something else that we do not speak about enough right now, celebrated success. That's the success of the people that create growth, the people that create jobs. We've heard already why we've gone backwards in terms of faltering economic growth. We've heard about the regulations and need for reforms. Um, the fact that the size of the state is just too big. Yeah. And we are spending more than we are even receiving in tax take itself. So the case for growth is really self-evident, and many of you have heard this already, but this is actually about core principles, the principles that we, as politicians, as actually, I should say this, Conservative Party politicians that believe in economic freedoms and low taxes, because, of course, that's what we as Conservatives must always make the case for, my friends, because if we don't do that, no one else will do that. And if we do not, of course, Britain will just sleepwalk into a sleepier darker and actually I think more sinister version of this under Starmer and Labour. We haven't even mentioned the prospect of what a socialist government would do to our country. But this is of course why we are here today. Because we do believe not just in growing the economy stronger. We do believe in the principles of sound money. Yes, living within our means as well. We do believe in tackling debt. The fact that government debt is now reaching record breaking levels. And that's despite you know, the work that takes place, even by the Chancellor today. He's obviously got the autumn statement to look forward to and will have to make some difficult decisions. But the government is planning to take a record-breaking £1 billion in taxes from families and businesses. And the deficit alone could be £130 billion. The more the state spends, the more the state taxes. And that is what is creating the challenges that we are seeing. And you've heard just some ideas already about the prospects of reform. And this is really where we as Conservatives have to be the pioneers on tax reform, simpler taxes, deregulation, take away the complexities in the systems that we see. And actually, all my colleagues in government have experienced this self in terms of the hard choices we as politicians, political leaders, have to make. And there is something else, actually, about government spending and state spending. Because it is a bit lazy, quite frankly, and it's too easy when you're a Secretary of State to say, oh, you know, I need to fund this project, let's just scurl off to the Treasury with a begging basket and, you know, just ask the Chancellor or the Chief Secretary for a bit more money and we'll negotiate it within the margins and all this kind of stuff. Last year when I was Home Secretary, and this was way before the um, strikes all came in and everything else, it was quite obvious that there was going to be some significant negotiations in government around pay negotiations, and we all know the processes around public sector pay negotiations. I made it my mission to take resources 
from the back office, from the home office, from police and crime commissioners, to, put, to give bobbies on the beat actually the pay increase that they deserve, particularly those on lower pay. And that is actually more bobbies on the beat and not bureaucrats in their Whitehall bunkers literally coming up with the same old prescriptions. The same old prescriptions, oh, go to the Treasury, or we'll negotiate it in the next spending route and all of that kind of stuff. That is simply not a sustainable position to be in. And my friends, if we think about this, when you see the size of the state right now, when you see the amount of government spending that's taking place, these are the norms that have to be challenges, challenged. And we, whether it's in government or even on the back benches, we must absolutely aid our colleagues in government to say, think not just radically, but think to do things differently. And as Conservatives, we must be relentless, actually, in cutting out wasteful spending, but also inappropriate spending. Jacob has already just touched on the reach regulations and the flip-flopping that goes on between positions that are taken and you know, which, is, which is the activist voice that we're going to defend and support that day. But the fundamental principle here, my friends, is that, that taxpayers' hard-earned money has to be not just spent, but invested and used in a diligent and thoughtful way and the right kind of services. So, I absolutely agree with so much of what has been said today. My colleagues and actually their work in government too. And, you know, as a moment of reflection, back in the day, and this was back in the 1980s, many people, and there are so many, it's been so well documented, you think about the 364 economists signing that infamous letter, you know, completely rejecting the Margaret Thatcher and Geoffrey Howe premise around economic reforms and liberalisation. Those economic reforms and liberalisation that took place transformed our country for the better. It really did. And I think, actually, this is a salutary point to make because as Liz has experienced, others, my colleagues have experienced in government, and actually it's in governments across the last decade, whether it's under previous prime ministers as well. It's so easy for the naysayers to basically say, that's too difficult, that's too controversial, that's not going to work. It's too easy to run down politicians that want to be radical and reforming and come up with new ideas. And it is just too easy, and if I may say so, quite lazy to vilify politicians that actually want to stand up and give voice for reform. And that is why I think, you know, we are a year out now, potentially, before a general election. And this is a crucial um, period in our time, I think, as a political party. This is effectively what will differentiate us from the Socialist Party under Keir Starmer. We need to get growth back, and you've heard the arguments today as to how and why. We cannot be timid anymore. We cannot be risk adverse, and we cannot accept the status quo. Because currently, Politics and politicians in this country are just accepting big government, and we cannot have that. It's down to this generation of politicians to give the leadership from a conservative government that will re-energize the companies that you've heard about today, bring back the spirit of dynamism back into our economy, but actually back to the people of Britain once and for all. And that is how we make Britain grow again, and that is how we inspire investors to come back to our country and make sure they are the ones that help to grow our country so it becomes a beacon of success once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dame Priti Patel. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been an event about growth. The reality is the UK is growing, if you look closely at the latest ONS statistics from the last quarter, Q4 of 2019, until the second quarter, the end of this year. The UK grew, including the big dip of lockdown, by 1.8%. That was also the period, of course, after which Brexit was initiated in January 2020. So the UK grew by 1.8%, France grew by 1.7%, by the way, Germany grew by 0.2%. The US outclassed us all, growing by 6.1%, perhaps for reasons that we've been hearing. This is also a debate not just about growth, but productivity, how we convert our economic inputs into outputs. 
Productivity isn't everything, but it's almost everything, Milton Friedman once said, or maybe it was Alan Greenspan. But the reality is that annual productivity growth has averaged just 0.2% between 2007 and 2019. The 30 years before that, it averaged 10 times more, 2%, not 0.2%. And had we had pre-financial crisis rates of productivity growth, since then, ladies and gentlemen, the average UK worker would be at least £5,000 a year better off. Don't take it from me. They are ONS numbers. We've heard a lot of arguments here today. We've heard in particular that the Chancellor should use his autumn statement to cut taxation. We've heard from four cabinet minister, former cabinet ministers and we've heard that there are 60 MPs on the Tory benches supporting them. We're all now going to listen to the Chancellor, who's going to say something completely different. No tax cuts, at least for now. Some people will call that a split. Some people will call it a gaffe. Some people will call it chaos. Other people would call it democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me. I leave it to you to judge. Thank you.